Hello and welcome to Lost in Sci-Fi and Fantasy, where we are concluding Spooky Month with Jurassic Park, the book. The book that started it all. The book that inspired about six movies <laughs> and two TV series and a string of video games. Yeah. So, yes, we have finally come to the Jurassic Park book. Now, I have read this book many times, and I do absolutely love it. I have read it probably minimum six times, generally around 10 to 12 by now. I quite enjoy it. It is the first proper novel I read, and it is probably the book that got me back into reading. Because when I was younger, I had a lot of trouble reading, and I was mostly reading very, you know, kids' books. You know, I, I would read Rotten School, uh, I would attempt to read books like Charlie Bone and whatnot, but it just wasn't working out, until I learned of the fact that Jurassic Park is based off of a book, and I decided to read it. And I did. I really enjoyed it. I think part of what really got me hooked into the book was the fact that I really shouldn't have been reading it at the age I was. I was reading it at, like... 10, 12, 13-ish, and there's a lot of graphic, graphic violence in this book, but I really enjoyed it, and yeah, it's probably the book that got me into reading. After this, I read The Hobbit, and then I did some really dumb things, like trying to read both the like John Carter of Mars books and the Jurassic Park books back-to-back. And the way I would do it is I would try to read Jurassic Park, then I'd read uh, Princess of Mars, then I'd reread Jurassic Park, and then I'd reread Princess of Mars, and then I kind of ended up stuck in a small loop there, because the idea was that I'd like read Jurassic Park, then go Princess of Mars, then I would go and read like the uh, Jurassic Park, and then go straight into Lost World, and then read Princess of Mars, and go straight into the next one. I wasn't the brightest kid. <laughs> And the th the sad thing is, like, I did that for uh, maybe two loops. I just read those two books back and forth um, at least twice each. It it was a decision that I made. But it just shows just how much I enjoyed the Jurassic Park books. As I've read it over and over and over again, I have come to realize a lot of the, the what some people might classify as nitpicky things. And honestly, the more I read it, the more I can pick out. But the thing is, that's something that just happens with media that you love, is you're going to criticize it more and more because you notice more and more. You've you know experienced it a lot more and you've been able to pick out all these little small details that are like, hmm, that's a bit odd. Or like, what happened here? This ending is a little bit rushed in comparison to what I thought it was. And yeah, even like the description that I've written down, because I wrote down a, a generic Jurassic Park sequence, and that is um, prologue, uh, raptor guy, uh, vacation family, hospital, doctor adventure. I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, oh, sample shuffle. Grant's Dig, Lawyers and Espionage, Travel Time, Welcome, Tour, Park Tour, uh, Raptor Sighting, Six Stegosaurus, Dino Miscount, Raptors on a Boat, uh, Attack, Recover, Collapse. That is the sequence of events that I have written down. Uh, the, as you might have guessed, the last three are about half of the book. <laughs> Actually, maybe a little over half of the book, because... Yeah, a lot happens just, like, at the end there. But yeah, so it's a lot different in comparison to the movie. But something that just kind of happens when I read it now is as I'm reading it, I can still picture, like, the scenes happening in the context of the movie. Because a lot of what is in the book, or at least a lot of what you see in the movie, is ripped straight from the book. Even specific lines. Some of them might be rearranged and, like, put into a different place, but... It's ripped straight from the book, most of it. 
most of what is actually portrayed in Jurassic Park, the movie, is, you know, just a stripped away portion. You know, I'll just it's the same general story, just cut down, cutting a lot of different things out. But for the most part, not bad. <laughs> and of course, they changed who dies and some of the characters that just exist. But we'll go ahead and just kind of start diving into it. So this book begins with about six, well, I'm going to say it's about 60-ish to 80-ish pages of a mystery just kind of happening. That is uh, Raptor Guy. So Raptor Guy is a man is brought in with terrible injuries to this kind of almost middle-of-the-nowhere clinic. And they bring him in. And she, the doctor, she keeps asking, like, what happened? Like, what, what, what's up with this guy? Like, like, what happened? And the, they keep saying, oh, it was a construction equipment, uh, a backhoe just kind of ran over him and dragged him. But she keeps saying, like, well, these, you know, these wounds don't match that kind of thing. And they're like, no, 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 it was, you know, it was just an accident. But she's like, yeah, he was definitely mauled, and they're definitely keeping something from me. So she tried to take pictures. The guy woke up, started saying st something about a raptor. No one really knows what they mean, because there isn't a name for raptor, really, uh, in Spanish, even though I kind of think there is. But um, the, the whole issue is, like, there's a miscommunication of translation, uh, to where they're like, oh, it's, it's like a, he means the spirit that comes and steals children. That kind of thing. But that's not the case. Anyway, it's very obvious he's been attacked by something. And she tries to help, but he succumbs to his wounds after sitting up, vomiting everywhere, and then just kind of dying. Uh, and when she goes, after saying to them, like, we did everything we could, they take the guy away. And they're like, yeah, you tried. And when she goes to look at the camera again... It's gone. So, no camera. Then we jump to Vacation Family. Vacation Family, uh, this is basically the beginning of Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World, the second movie. This is where that scene comes from. It is a family going to a secluded beach, and their daughter runs off and is attacked by some kind of lizard. Though instead of just cutting away after she gets attacked, and also it's not on the island, it's on the mainland. But after she gets attacked, we actually follow her to the hospital. Uh, that's where hospital comes in. And then Doctor Adventure is the doctor that's there. Goes looking for the the lizard that attacked the girl. Because they're like, uh, you know, we have some lizards. It sounds kind of like you're describing a basilisk, but I don't know. So one of the doctors goes out and finds like the remains of the lizard, uh, only the lower half having been half eaten by a howler monkey. And then from here, it comes sample shuffle, where we follow some samples as they were taken from the girl, the saliva samples and whatnot, and the toxicity report. But after the girl gets discharged, a lot of the samples get destroyed save for some of them to be sent off to uh, a college to get checked out. And then some of the... Uh, then the lizard fragment gets sent off to get identified. And they're like, oh, it's probably a basilisk. But then, like, the secretary's like, oh, no, that's like a dinosaur, I'm pretty sure. So they then get in contact with Grant. That's where we join Grant's dig. He is currently uncovering a juvenile velociraptor. But his dig is interrupted when they are visited by a agent of the EPA who is asking some questions about things that are going on with, like, Hammond and his association and, like, what he might be doing in Costa Rica. Grant doesn't know. Turns out Grant has been consulted on, like, the juvenile behavior of, like, uh, the animals he's primarily digging up, not the raptors, the uh, uh, hydrosaurs. He presented a paper and 
tried to do findings, but Gennaro really annoyed the shit out of him. So he ended up cutting it off early, but still was receiving funding from Hammond to send some samples off with uh, t- to Hammond. But for the most part, their dig was kind of questionable. But while they're hanging around after the EPA guy leaves, they get a call from the doctor's assistant asking, like, hey, could we send the sample over and send you the, like, a fax of what it looks like and everything? And he's like, oh, well, sure. They get the fax and it's like, definitely, like, a dinosaur. But they also get a call from Hammond, who rambles, but eventually invites them to the island to visit. And while they don't really want to, they are kind of sort of required because of the fact that he provides funding and also he does indeed provide additional funding through their consultancy fee. So they agree. Then we go to lawyers and espionage, so we kind of divert away from them for a while and we follow I I, I can't remember the exact sequence, but we follow Biosyn I believe, as they are preparing to embark on their espionage of of, uh, InGen. And we get some backstory about, like, what Biosyn does and the kind of dubious genetics that they have done in the past. Then we follow as we, uh, Gennaro is preparing for the island visit, and he's told by his bosses that if there's any sign, anything fishy, anything wrong, burn it to the ground because we've invested too much into this and I'd rather it to be a write-off than to drag us down. Then we continue our espionage when Dotson meets up with Nedry. They discuss their fees and he's given the Gillette can, not the Barbasol can. And it's pretty much exactly the same as it is uh, there. Then we have travel time. This is where they are picked up by Hammond and taken to pick up Malcolm. That's where Malcolm's properly introduced. And then they just kind of chat on their way to the island. Then they finally arrive. Welcome. They make it to the island, and as they're working their way down, because the like landing pad is kind of very small and like surrounded by trees and whatnot... But as they work their way down, they see Apatosaurs. That is the biggest uh, sauropod that they actually grew in the book. Because they felt that it wouldn't really work to grow anything bigger because it's a pretty fucking small island. The island in the book is described as about 8 miles long and I think 5 miles wide. It's either 5 or 3. But in an upside down teardrop shape and... Even then, they're kind of inconsistent about the description of, like, things. And funnily enough, also, in the sequel, the sequel comes with a map, which I I always love a map. And the shape of the island and the way it looks on the sequel's map is pretty much the description of the island from uh, Jurassic Park, the first book. So I found that very funny. Uh, another thing that I kind of forgot to mention is that Hammond sent a ton of, like, materials, like, uh, blueprints and shit to, to Grant, and he studied it on their way to the island as well, noticing that there's, you know, a ton of fencing, and there's some pretty nice resorts and everything, but we'll see. When they actually arrive to the visitor center, not the visitor center, the hotel, uh, one, they're met by Ed Regis, who is the PR manager, but he has to play babysitter to a bunch of paleontologists. And he's not very happy about having to do this. They notice that, you know, a lot of the plants and whatnot really shouldn't have been planted because they're highly toxic and whatnot, but they kind of brush it off. They also notice a big deviation from the plans being a lot of fencing and reinforced bars on all of the windows. They question this as it's kind of confusing as to why this is here. But they kind of brush it off for now and continue moving on. Then they take the tour through the labs and they learn how the dinosaur DNA is taken. It's not just from mosquitoes, it's from any bug that bites uh, and gets stuck in sap. 
and they go through the nursery and they play with a little baby velociraptor that hops in Tim's arms and whatnot, but Grant gets a little too touchy and the the raptor gets very annoyed and stressed out and almost dies of a heart attack. But yeah, they also see the control room and how things operate where you can see like the gears turning behind Malcolm as he's asking his questions. And when they finally get through and they start beginning their tour, things start to kind of fall into place because we then, when we hit the park tour, first they visit the raptors who are just kind of in a cage in the back. They aren't part of the actual tour because they are master escapers, sorry, escape artists and extremely violent. That is part of the reason why they had to reinforce the lodge. Because, whoopsie doodle, it got out and attacked a workman. Yeah. But after they go, and they're looking at some of the other dinosaurs, Tim notices a velociraptor running through a field. They shouldn't be out in the actual park. But he noticed it, and they try to see, but they can't quite catch anything. Then they come across the sick Stegosaurus. This is, in the movie, the sick Triceratops, where they're introduced to Dr. Harding. And they work their way through and figure out what is wrong with the Stegosaurus. Now, in the movie, they don't really solve this problem. But they do solve it in the book. In the book, it is determined that it is the West Indian lilac. But what is causing it isn't that they're eating the plant directly... They're eating the stones, the gizzard stones, and they use that to like grind up the plant material, and then they spit out the stones like every like couple of weeks. But the problem is that as they're taking in the stones, they're taking in the berries that fall from the plants, and they're getting sick because of that. But while they're in the middle of trying to solve this mystery, Grant finds an eggshell. And this is his beginning of proof that the dinosaurs are breeding. Because there's there was a big question in the lab of like, okay, so the dinosaurs, they shouldn't be able to breed, right? Why? Oh, we irradiate them to kill all, like, material, and all of them are female. But seeing this eggshell proves to Grant that they are breeding. Because the eggshell is nearly flat, suggesting that it's a quite large egg. And so, it must be a dinosaur egg, unless they have ostriches. Then he asks a question like, okay, well, specifically Malcolm asks, like, hey, f let's do an experiment. Up the parameters of animals. And they do. And they find that there's more animals. Then continue upping it. Keep upping it as much as you can. And they find out that there are a ton of extra animals. They've been breeding all over the place. They still don't fully believe that they're actually breeding, but the numbers are there. Now, this is where I get a little frustrated. This is kind of the beginning of my frustration a little bit. And that is the kind of lack of panic. The panic does actually start coming up later in the book, but right here, right now, they have just found out that the raptors aren't just miscounted. They're vastly miscounted they're expecting like seven velociraptors and there is about 29 additional velociraptors on top of that and they do not freak out immediately they do not panic they do not try to get the fuck out of there right then and right there partially because grant wants to count the nests because based off of some reason he suspects that there would be like three nests around the island or something like that i i don't know how he determines it but he, he does but anywho they move on they this is actually where the party splits so Gennaro, sattler and harding take the jeep back while everyone else hops onto or into the uh, car and while they're working their way through the kids notice on a boat that's leaving, a velociraptor is on board. They are able to see it, like, running around on the deck. And so now the race is on. They have to get back to the control room 
well, they, they try contacting using the radios, but the storm is interfering. Then they try to get back to the control room, but something's going on with the power. We are now in attack. So what happens is Nedry puts his plan into place. He shuts everything down, goes, gets the embryos, and then takes a jeep, the only other gas-powered jeep, out into the park. His plan is that it should take about six minutes there, six minutes back, and they shouldn't notice him. The thing is, even while he's on his way there, they notice he's missing. Along the way, he does take a wrong turn and gets lost and ends up by a river where where he encounters the Dilophosaur. Now, in the movie, the Dilophosaur is about, I don't know, four feet high, give or take. But in the book, it is ten feet tall. And it spits at him, hits his chest, and it's like stinging and tingling. And he goes to go to his car, but he, like an idiot, turns back to check on it and gets spat in the face and then he gets killed the description is very brutal and whatnot but i'll save that for you guys to read then as they're going along the cars stop and they are just sitting there they're outside the tyrannosaur uh, exhibit and they're just kind of waiting hopefully the power comes back on but they they're just chilling uh, while Nedry is gone, like I said, they notice in the control room that he's missing, and they're trying to get things fixed, but they're having trouble. Uh, Muldoon goes out to try and get them, but the jeep's gone. Earlier, he had loaded the jeep up with some ro- a rocket launcher, just in case. But the jeep's gone, so now he needs to try to find that. So they're they're currently waiting for Harding and co to come back with the jeep so that he can go out and you know try to get things cleaned up and hopefully find the other jeep but no while they're out and out in the park chilling tim notices something go in between the cars but didn't quite catch what it was even though he has his night vision goggles and then they see the big rex just kind of push the fence down and the attack begins now, both of Lex and Tim are in the car. When the car gets picked up, Lex falls out, and then the car gets thrown by the Rex into a tree. Then Malcolm gets chased down by the Rex and, like, well, bit. Like, he gets picked up and, like, shook, uh, but then tossed aside. And then Grant gets punted by the Rex. We meet Tim again a while later in the tree. He has to work his way down. He leaves the radio, leaves his watch, but takes the night vision goggles with him. And then they go, he meets up with his sister and Grant, and then they're able to start working their way through. Ed Regis, who is in this one, the one to abandon the kids, he ran off into the woods, scared. Then he, when he hears the kids, starts working his way back. But then he decides uh, the T-Rex might still be around, so he continues along down at the bottom of the hill and is working his way following the road back to um, the control room. But he gets intercepted by the juvenile Rex, and Grant and the kids are watching as he gets attacked by the juvenile Rex. It just kind of plays with him for a bit, and then it kills him. The kids and Grant run off into the park, because they don't want to continue going that way, because that would be bad, and they don't want to be trapped with potentially a Rex, and they just saw what happened to someone who decided to do that. So they flee into the park and make their way, trying to like follow the sensors, hopefully to trigger them when they're going along, but sadly, the power's off. So they shack up in the uh, one of the storage things. Now, one of the most frustrating things about the book is how close they keep getting to finding Nedry, but they ignore the lights that they see, or they get super close to finding Grant and the kids, but they just so happen to like be at the wrong uh, supply bunker, or, or at the wrong uh, fence, that kind of thing. Or they're literally like 
10, 20 feet apart. They just don't notice each other. That kind of thing. It's slightly frustrating. <laughs> but yeah. But eventually the power comes back on and they begin like the cleanup phase while Grant and the kids are out in the park. There's some efforts to try to keep an eye out for them, but they're having trouble. This is the recovery. And we pretty much, uh, after Harding comes back, Muldoon and Gennaro go out on an adventure to try to clean things up. They specifically find the wrecks and whatnot. You know, things are going pretty good. But Malcolm, who was re who gets recovered, is in a bad way. And he's getting super drug-fucked and pontificating on the park and whatnot. I'll be honest, upon rereading, those parts get super tedious. Because he goes on for fucking pages, just pontificating about like, Oh man, the philosophy of this and that. And, you know, this is... This was doomed to fail from the beginning, et cetera, et cetera. It gets really annoying to reread that bit because it goes on for so long. Uh, he's just kind of hanging out. They're going out trying to find the kids, but at the same time just trying to clean things up. But things are going pretty smooth. But Malcolm doesn't feel that things are going to continue going smooth. He's pretty sure things are going to collapse fast. And that's where collapse comes in. Because at this point, things do collapse. Turns out, when Arnold rebooted the system to get the phones back online, he, oopsie poopsie, accidentally turned off all of the power, and thus they were running off of backup power this entire time. Whoops. And they're running out of auxiliary power. And when they're running on auxiliary power, the fences weren't powered this entire time. The pen, the fences, the fences were off the entire night, essentially. And it is at this point that shit hits the fan. Now, I don't know why the Velociraptors waited so long to attack. Maybe they were attacking the entire time. I don't know. But they attack right as the power goes off again, <laughs> for some reason. But this is where the shit re-hits the fan. As the Velociraptors are attacking, they're trying to figure out how to get the power back on. They send Arnold to go reboot the power, you know, switch it over to the other auxiliary tank and so that they can try to reboot the power. He gets attacked and killed in the generator room. So then they send Gennaro in after they come back and Gennaro goes in and gets attacked by a Velociraptor, but he doesn't die. He ends up hiding uh, and gets attacked by Compies, so he's hiding in a truck that's for some reason in there. Like, I don't fully know how that works i don't know but yeah so he hides in a truck then grant goes in when him and the kids come back and are able to uh talk to the people that have moved over into the lodge like uh woo after john john arnold um n d doesn't report back he goes picks up muldoon who ends up like wedging himself in a pipe and he blows up blows the leg off of a velociraptor it doesn't blow it off the Velociraptor, he just kind of severely wounds it, because for some reason, they start describing the Velociraptors as these, like, near-immortal tanks of beings. They're extremely durable, they have distributed nervous systems, so even a shot to the head wouldn't really phase them. They have extremely strong bones, uh, they bleed super slow, so even if you do, like, massive damage to them they'll still keep fighting because they aren't going to bleed out super fast. So it's like, okay, earlier in the book, you described them as these Ooh, super delicate, fragile creatures. Oh, don't hurt that uh, tiny baby velociraptor. It might have a heart attack to these fucking hulking machines of beasts that just keep powering through no matter what you throw at them. Because it turns out that the one that got its leg damaged is the one that attacked Gennaro. And so I guess either the Velociraptors like swapped out um, when when they... Like the one that attacked Arnold versus the one that attacked Gennaro. I don't know. It's weird. But yeah, so the kids are put into the kitchen while Grant goes to reboot things. Uh, where they get cornered by a Velociraptor. They lock it in the freezer. And then they move on they go into the control room to start trying to reboot things but as like the power comes back on 
Tim's trying to figure out how to reboot things, but it's not going out so well. And the Velociraptors are now coming after them. They're able to like jump 10 feet in the air onto a balcony. And they're also... So the Lodge people decide to try to distract the Velociraptors so that Grant could go in to reboot the power. And the way they do this is they have two Velociraptors on the roof. They have, as far as they are concerned, four more Velociraptors outside of the fence that they need to try to get the attention of. Now, something that confuses me is, one, how they describe it here and how they describe it later. And that is, they say that the Velociraptors that got on the roof, they probably climbed a tree. Because they planted a tree too close to, like, the fence, and they were able to climb over into or onto the roof. Ellie then uses this tree, which is actually planted on the inside of the fence, to climb onto the roof when she's uh, being chased by velociraptors. And she's also it's also described that she's just absolutely loving this for some reason. She's like, yeah, this is fucking awesome. But the, the plan is, she goes out, uses herself as bait to lure them to the fence. And then from there, they keep teasing, or she keeps teasing it, them. And they also then start to keep her attention. Now, it is later described that what they were planning was they were distracting her while another velociraptor went onto the roof. Which doesn't make sense, because the way that the book tries to describe it is it's that the velociraptors that were at the roof already, that were trying to break the bars and shit to get into Malcolm's room, they're the ones that went over and, like, end up killing Wu when he's like, hey, you know, you need to get back inside. Like, that that's what is kind of implied, but then they later describe it as, like, oh, you know, a Velocir- they were distracting her while a Velociraptor got onto the roof. It's like, no, they were already there. Anywho, after the runaround on the lodge with Ellie, Grant's able to get the power rebooted, he finds Gennaro and works his way back. Now, something that is also a little bit confusing is the amount of dead guards... There's at least two dead guards in the building. One by the guard's desk, at the like the front desk, and one at the end of a corridor near the control room. Now, when Velociraptors got in and attacked these guards, I don't know. Also, how just an erroneous ear ended up in the control room, I also do not know. None of this is really explained, and I, I get that it's supposed to be like, oh man, shit really went down here kind of thing. But it's like, okay, but how did it go down? Because, like, Henry Wu was in the in, in the control room for a good while. And then he had to leave, get in a jeep, go to Muldoon, pick up Muldoon, who was also surrounded by velociraptors, and then leave. Like, just the amount of velociraptors that just kind of appear and disappear is a little bit weird, but yeah, anywho. <laughs> There's also a massive question of how the Velociraptors bred unnoticed. My best guess that I can think of is that they bred while they were attempted to be kept in normal captivity. So they were like out in the park, being kept out there, but because of their escapes and whatnot, they were taken back. And that's when they bred? Question mark. My best guess. Because otherwise, they kept them in a relatively small pin near the visitor center. So you would think that they would be able to keep track of the velociraptors and their breeding habits, or or lack thereof, as they're, you know, they assume. But you would still kind of notice if, like, they disappeared from the pen. Because that would be the only place you're expecting to see velociraptors. I don't know. It's very confusing there. Anywho, uh, the kids leave the control room to take a look at the velociraptors that are coming their way. And whoopsie doodle, the door closed, and because the power's on, so are the door locks. The doors are locked, and they can't get back into the control room. They need a key card. But there's a dead guard just kind of down the hall, so they quickly run over there, grab it, but got the attention of the velociraptors, so they have to go into the nearest room that they could. The nursery where they're attacked by the little baby velociraptor. But it's more that the baby velociraptor's hungry, and it wants its milk. 
They try to distract the big velociraptors with the little one because they forgot to close the door. And the big velociraptors come in and just kill the baby. They continue moving in deeper to the nursery and lab. And they end up running into Grant and Gennaro, who worked their way in. And, yeah. But they can't really continue going that way. So Grant has to face the three velociraptors, mono, imano, mono, mono. And I guess mono e trio. And what he, the way he does this is he goes into the nursery with the eggs and he gets the extremely toxic poison that was Chekhov's gunned at the beginning of the book. And he injects an egg with it, rolls it, but not far enough so the velociraptors don't really pay attention. Takes another one, rolls it, but it gets to the velociraptor, but they don't eat it. So he takes another one, injects it, Rolls it really hard, and it gets the attention of a velociraptor. It goes, grabs it, eats it, and it's like, ha! Huh? And then it goes to attack Grant, and then it falls dead. Then one of the other velociraptors goes and starts, like, eating the other one, but not much. Then it, after it gets shaken off by the dying velociraptor, it goes and grabs an egg, eats it, dies. And so it's just the third one. Grant lures it into another room, keeping as many tables and whatnot between it. He kind of hides and is able to sneakily inject it as he distracts it with the radio, with Ellie talking on it. Now he injects it into the Velociraptor and it freaks out for a bit and then dies. He's happy and they move on. They're able to get into the room. They're able to get the power reinstated, get the electric grid turned on for the lodge to stop the velociraptors that are still trying to get into the lodge, and they're able to call the boat and tell them, hey, you need to get back here. They eventually find the velociraptor that was on the boat and kill it. Now it's time for cleanup again. Specifically, the island is now doomed. After they called the Coast Guard, they are almost certainly going to come and firebomb the place. But before that happens, Grant really wants to count the nests because they need to check to see if any have already gotten off the island. If they have, then there's going to be some big fucking trouble. So they go out to start cleaning things up and f count the nests. They drag Gennaro along. At this point, Gennaro's been kind of made a semi-villain made to be held accountable for his uh, contribution in this. He must join them in counting the eggs. And he's very reluctant and whatnot, and even Muldoon turns against him. And so they go, they count the nests. There are three nests. They count a total of like 30-something additional velociraptors, and all seem to be accounted for, so none have gotten off, at least as far as I can tell. That's what they mean. It's like, oh, we should be okay. But they also get super distracted because the velociraptors are uh, displaying weird behavior. And then they run off onto the beach. They follow to see them just kind of looking. Looking out at the ocean. They're doing something for some reason. And it turns out what they're doing is they want to migrate. They see the boat coming and they see it as their chance to migrate. So they're like, ah, shit. They're like birds and whatnot, a thing that we've been talking about this entire fucking book. Uh, meanwhile, Hammond decides to go for a bit of a stroll because he doesn't want to hear a uh, dying Malcolm continue to die. So he goes for a stroll and gets spooked because the kids play a recorded Tyrannosaur roar and he thinks it's real and thinks it's like the, the juvenile. So he flees, falls down a hill, breaks his leg and has to try to slowly hobble his way up. But as he's hobbling his way up, he gets uh, approached by some compies that bite him and fill him with the toxin that just kind of makes you feel good as they eat you, and he gets eaten. Then the military come in, pick everyone up, and leave. And they firebomb the entire island. They're stuck at a hotel indefinitely. The kids are going to be let go eventually, but... As far as the adults are concerned, they're probably going to be stuck there for quite a while. And that's how the book ends. Now, things that happen. Uh, at the end of this book, Malcolm dies. 
or is dead because as they're leaving, they're like, oh, what about Malcolm? And Muldoon just shakes his head, no, saying he died. And it is, it is even mentioned that they weren't allowed to hold a, any kind of burial for Hammond or Ian Malcolm. So it is, it is very heavily stated Malcolm dies. But he is indeed the protagonist of the second book. Things that are left to question. What happened to the Big Rex? Presumably, it drowned because they got super distracted when they were getting ready to head out and get the Rex. So the Rex ends up passing out when it's attacking Lex and Tim uh, when they're hiding in a waterfall waiting for Grant to come out. And when it passes out, it falls into the water. And presumably, like, it just drowns because no one came to get it and it was knocked the fuck out. Who knows? It also possibly slightly bled out because it bit its tongue. Like, that tongue gets shredded throughout this fucking book. And so it, it almost certainly died. I mean, especially when the firebombs came. Maybe it survived the firebombs because it was hiding in the lake. Who knows? But, yeah. Then... There's the baby Triceratops that Lex plays with. There's the baby Velociraptor that they play with. The other one that doesn't get uh, eaten. Uh, it's also heavily implied that the Velociraptors have escaped and they are sustaining themselves off of beans and soy uh, as well as chickens in a very remote area. So, oops, there's probably Velociraptors out in the world. What are they going to do? Will it be the topic of the sequel? No. That, it actually gets completely left on the floor and kind of buried a bit. They just ignore it for the sequel. It's their choice. But yeah, it is my favorite book, probably. I really enjoy it. I have reread it and reread it, and it is also now my first uh, ebook. I, I bought it because I, I was reading it while I was at work, and I forgot it one day, and I wanted to continue reading it. So I bought the ebook and just started reading it on my phone. I was like, oh, wow, that makes this a little bit easier to, to be able to read at work. Yay. Instead of having to have the full book and whatnot. But yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It has a lot of flaws, especially, you know, of the time flaws because it's like late 80s, early 90s. There's a bit of casual misogyny just kind of hanging around. Uh, Michael Crichton doesn't necessarily condone the misogyny in the book, but he does definitely just kind of like let it stand. You know, the explanation that Grant gives as to why Gennaro went with uh, Dr. Sattler and Dr. Harding is it's probably the shorts because she's wearing shorts. Uh, Tim creepily kind of stares at her legs for a bit when they first meet. It's weird. Uh, Tim and Lex's ages are pretty much flipped in the book, so technically they're flipped in the movie, where Tim is the older one, and Lex is extremely fucking annoying the entire time. Like, something that I do really not like about books and whatnot that have, like, a little kid in it is the seeming misunderstanding that kids can at least get the context of a situation they can understand to just shut the fuck up sometimes. Like, Lex constantly is, like, screaming in people's ears while they're trying to focus on something. Or she's complaining the entire time. Or she forgets to buckle her life vest. And so now there's a question of whether or not she's going to survive when they go over a waterfall. Or she coughs really loud or she's asking really dumb questions like, can we eat these random berries that are just kind of hanging around? Like, they really, he really leaned in and was like, let's make her annoying as fuck. When I'm pretty sure kids in, like, very stressful situations can, like, lock in at least a little bit and understand, like, okay, I need to be quiet. I need to try to get through this, but no, she, she doesn't ever, and it's so, so annoying, but yeah, overall, very good book, I do highly recommend reading the book, it can get a little bit, meh, nah, at times, but if you push through, it's overall pretty good, the ending just kind of comes and the, it just ends, 
Um, the, I will be reading the second book, not right now, but I, in a couple months I have it planned out because there is the new Jurassic World movie coming out. And I figured might as well try to get the second book out for then. Then we can continue on with the rest of the movies. I will also be doing the newest Jurassic World movie before going back and doing three World, Fallen Kingdom, and Dominion. So that's kind of the, the order that that's going to happen. So I'll be doing Rebirth, then three, then World, Fallen Kingdom, Dominion. That's how it's going to go. But I am looking forward to the new movie. I uh, am very, very excited. And hopefully you guys are looking forward to hearing me talk about it. But anywho, with that said, I think we can call it there. Spooky Month is officially over. But we're going to keep some of the uh, horror-esque stuff going with Jaws next week. And horror adjacent with uh, uh, Starship Troopers. But with that said, thank you guys so much for listening. If you guys enjoyed this, feel free to give it a like, comment, and subscribe if you are listening on YouTube. Or feel free to rate, review it, and share it with your friends on any podcast catcher of your choice. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening. I will talk to you guys next week. Goodbye.